everybody, it's Master Gallengeist here, bringing you my review for The Sandman Season 1 on Netflix. And I, I went into this looking forward to it because the trailers and everything look pretty good to it. After having watched these 10 episodes, I think it's very kind of, I'm neutral on it. Like, there's a lot of stuff that really just doesn't work. And I do that more to the content, more than the actors that they've gotten, because I understand that it's kind of hard to do certain kind of things with this show. And I'm not that familiar with the source material myself. I would like to probably read the graphic novel at a certain point to, like, get everything kind of together, but from what I've just seen with the ten episodes, it just doesn't really work very well. It's not the kind of worst thing that I've seen, but it's a very just kind of, like, eh. Like, it got very kind of boring to me, and it's almost like it's stretched and stuffed too much shit at once in here. Like... I almost would have been okay with most of this detailing and having more kind of time with certain characters because they were kind of more interesting. Morpheus gets the most development since he's the one that kind of goes through through all. And the thing is, I really like the actor that they got from Morpheus. He really kind of sells it. I like how he speaks and how we kind of get a handle for the character. Uh, his kind of librarian, Lucien, is an interesting character as well, being the kind of attendant and having to deal with shit in his realm of the dreaming. But other than that, well, also Matthew the Raven and trying to, like, help him and figure out stuff of what's going to go on. And then the thing is, each other kind of character gets enough development for certain kind of stories that they have, but it never gets me really invested in them. Like... Uh, this Burgess dude, uh, he lost his son. Because we're starting off at, like, 1916, and we see this Burgess dude has got this dude bringing this kind of uh, grimoire from a museum in England, and they're both in England, and he's attempting to pretty much capture death because he wants to bring their kids back to life. They died in, like, World War One, So... They're trying to do this. We see that Morpheus goes with his vestments of his helmet, his sand, and his ruby to uh, get the Corinthian, who is an escaped nightmare, and instead of capturing death, as the Corinthian has pretty much killed this person, uh, Morpheus is captured, his vestments taken from him, and we see that Burgess pretty much lives longer. He's got a son uh, who's not really his son that kind of like grows up around seeing everything like that they're both kind of elongated by their lives just by having the vestments but that's never really explained why that would happen that way um there's just a lot of stuff that like probably would need kind of connective explanations but they just build a the like corinthian comes tells him to build a glass bubble to house morpheus for some odd reason it's like uh, all right like, we're told and learned that he's, like, the king of dreams, king of nightmares, he's an endless, and I'm like, okay, how do you contain something like that? You do a spell, and then you put him in a glass sphere. It's like, and? Now, granted, there's also runes and shit around, but it's like a rune kind of circle. I'm like, how does the sphere thing do anything? Okay, and then we see that his bird also tries to, like, help him out, uh, Jessime, uh, Raven, and... The Alex dude, the Burgess's son, kills it with a shotgun, and Morpheus doesn't like that. So then it's pretty much like a hundred years later. We get to like 2021 or whatnot. And the thing is, Alex had been together with this other dude. He's trying to talk to Morpheus, but they accidentally break the whole thing. He's able to get out. He puts the Alex dude to sleep for pretty much eternity uh, as punishment. And then starts getting together to try and, like, figure out what's kind of going on. So the main kind of bulk of, like, the first one is seeing him imprisoned and how people act like assholes. Uh, Burgess also had another son uh, with this Ethel chick. And she steals the vestments and runs away because the Burgess dude wanted her to abort. And she didn't. And she's just running around as a thief. 
and she barters away most of the vestments. Uh, she like auctions off the sand. She trades the helm to like a demon in hell for a protective amulet, and she doesn't have the ruby because her son takes it and just becomes a dull hole using it to do whatever crazy ass shit he wants. So Morpheus pretty much got back into present day, sees that his realm is pretty much in tatters. Everybody's kind of left. We learned that Cain and Abel is there for some fucking reason. Um, for up, like, taking care of the houses of secrecy and mysteries. And that there's a gargoyle, and that Morpheus needs more power, so he pretty much takes the gargoyle and gets his power back. And then he kind of like goes through these dreams to offer him to the fates to figure out where his vestments are. He gets that, but he also gets an egg that hatches into another gargoyle and gives it to Cain and Abel. And they're like, oh, cool. And then they fight about like naming it. It's like, all right. So then he kind of goes on his little kind of quests, which are just bottled into pretty much single episodes. He gets introduced to Joanna Constantine. Constantine, sorry. That is how it's pronounced in the show. And I was like, okay. And I'm semi-loosely uh, have an understanding of, like, John Constantine, uh, having seen the Counter Reese movie, uh, knowing a little bit from, like, the shows. I'm not that well-versed with him. Uh, and then I do know that this is not, like, a gender-swapped one, that this is a character in the Sandman universe, which is kind of connected to the DC universe, but I'm not quite sure how it is. Kind of like how Watchmen is owned by DC, but just recently kind of got thunderously connected to the like multiverse through stuff that was going on with that. Yes, it's confusing, but I'm just like, okay. And uh, she evidently had the sand, and she left it with her in her the apartment that she shared with her girlfriend. But she left her girlfriend for reasons she's afraid that she'd get hurt or whatnot and didn't tell her or whatnot so it's like all right she keeps having a reoccurring nightmare that like this one friend of hers uh was fucking around and opened up a portal to like hell and then she was trying to close it but then the girl that was the daughter of the one dude gets sucked into hell and it's like okay are they gonna work with that at all nope uh, no even though his helm's in hell he doesn't do anything about that i'm like all right but they find out that the ex-girlfriend was pretty much using the sand like a drug. That she's pretty much almost dead from it. And uh, he wants Morpheus to help her. And she, he just puts her in a dream and lets her pass peacefully. I'm like, is there any... Like, it's not even really explained why he couldn't do anything to, like, help her or whatnot. It's like, um, is there anything that we can do with this? No? Okay. And she's making a big deal of, like, don't kill her. It's like... She's pretty much already dead. All right. And then they pretty much part ways. We had pretty much been introduced to her pretty much uh, doing an exorcism. Uh, but we thought it was going to be it for this princess, but it was actually the other dude. And the thing is, Morpheus wanted to, like, interrogate the dude uh, for information on the hel helm. But uh, Joanna just fucking, like, flung him back into hell before any of that could be done. So then Morpheus now has the sand, so he's kind of more close to his power, decides to go into hell. This was an interesting kind of thing. Like, he's walking through, a monarch has to be invited into another monarch's realm, goes through. He also sees this one not a chick that was his lover 10,000 years ago, but that doesn't really do much. There's like a lot of like droppings of like, okay, this could have been important, and it's like, all right, it really isn't. And a cool kind of thing is that we saw Nadja, uh, not just, sorry, that's what we do in the shadows. Nada's view of Morpheus and how he looks to her, and that lined up pretty well because even though it was two different actors, they did similar mannerisms and speech styles, so it was kind of cool to see that. And that evidently she defied him, and that's why she's in hell. I'm like, all right. So he pretty much gets to Lucifer, played by uh, Brienne of Tarth from Game of Thrones. And she's like, oh, yeah, here, here's all this stuff. You're not going to find hope and dreams in hell kind of shit. And then we see the demon that's got us like, oh, how about you guys fight for it? So he names Lucifer as his champion. Dream will be him. And we pretty much have a metaphysical fight of, like, what trumps what. 
and Morpheus ends with hope. Like, the thing is, I get it. It's the execution that I don't like. Like, I get hope uh, triumphing. Yeah. I get hope triumphing over anti-life and everything like that. And I think that was a nice little nod to the DC Universe with, like, the anti-life equation and all that kind of stuff. But... And it's like, all right, he wins, he gets the helm, it works off, and Lucifer's like, Morpheus. It's like, all right. Like, I I understand that there should be conflict there and I should be invested in it. I'm just not. And the thing is, it's not really completely bad. It's more the content of the actors of it not being interesting. Not completely horrendous, not completely bad yet. So he's got the helm back, and then we see that the John dude was pretty much his... Uh, mother's like, you need to know what's going on with the ruby. You gotta give it back. It's like, oh no, it only works for me. And then the mother gives him the amulet uh, protection thing, and then she dies. Didn't care about that. And then he starts going, and people are like, freeze! And then, like, anytime they attack him, they start splattering and spurring and dying. Um, because we had seen that the Corinthian was kind of threatening her, and then she used the amulet, and he got fucking dusted back in the dream. He was like, fuck you, Lucien! And then kind of goes back out to do his shit. Which, he's just a dude that, like, kills people, takes their eyes, and eats them with his eye mouths. Like, I like the actor for the Corinthian, I just don't give a f Like, there's a lot of characters that I don't care about. Like, there's no investment that I get from them. It, it's really pretty and it does really good effects and there's certain things that should be drawing me in that they just aren't it's like it's like if you went to a burger place that did things like your other favorite burger place however it only looks like it and when you bite into it it's just not right it's not shit it's not completely bad but if you go to McDonald's and you expect a Five Guys or an In-N-Out or any kind of premium Shake Shack, like like upper tier uh, fast food thing versus the lower tier, you're not going to get the same thing. It might not be horrendous, but you're just going to be like, this doesn't work for me. And that's like this whole show for me. Because uh, the characters, I don't get drawn enough and in to really care about, to really see them achieve their goals except for like Morpheus so we see that the John dude then gets sucked into this whole thing with this Rosemary and a Rottweiler and he goes he gets the ruby uh, Morpheus tried to get the ruby got blasted we then have this bottle episode pretty much where he's utilizing the ruby to make it so that way nobody can lie and you kind of get certain characters involved there but they're just doing shit at a diner and then Morpheus is like no they're not lying they're using their dreams as inspirations to, like, keep on living shit. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, that's cool, but I had to wade through all of this that I really didn't care about to kind of get there. And then they kind of have a fight, and then the thing is, John crushes the ruby, and that gives all the power back to Morpheus, even though he was trying to destroy Morpheus and become pretty much the one over the dreaming. And then he pretty much just puts him to sleep. It's like, all right... Then we get the kind of tail end bit, because when Morpheus was pretty much locked in his pretty much glass bubble thing, there were certain people that could never fall asleep again, and certain people that were just always stuck in sleep. So we are introduced to Unity Kincaid at that point, and that she somehow had a child. And then that child had a child, and we're introduced to Rose Walker, who is a child of the Endless, because Unity had this dream and this whole kind of life where she had a relationship with a man with gold eyes desire of the endless her and the uh, despair are trying to like teach dream a lesson i don't know what that is like oh he's not the most powerful one it's like he is a powerful important one but the thing is you all kind of work together because it's like death despair destruction delirium dream all the different kind of stuff though destruction is like left we got death I like the death one where they kind of walked around death showing uh, how she kind of like views her role and how they serve people because without them they don't really exist. She's going to be the last one and kind of end the universe by putting the chairs up and everything. And I'm like, okay, that's kind of cool. Uh, we're also introduced to this Hob dude. He's the only other kind of like character that's interesting because 
they pretty much do a kind of wager. Death makes them pretty much immortal, and Morpheus is trying to see if he'll wish for death, because he thought that would happen after 100 years, and it didn't. It happened in, like, uh, 1359 that they did this thing, and they kept going every 100 years, every 100 years, until Hobbes like, hey, you just need a friend, man. We also are introduced to Joanna Constantine's ancestor, and that's how he kind of, like, gets together with their family. Um, and then we see that Morpheus talks to him in the present day, and then there we go into the whole Rose Walker thing, and the Corinthians kind of going after her because she's a dream vortex. Never mind the fact that we don't really, like, it's nuts. She's an elder sister that's trying to find her younger brother because they were separated because, uh, they left the father, her and the mother, which the mother was the child of Hina D. Kincaid. No, wait. Great grandmother. Grand. So, granddaughter. Yeah. Unity Kincaid had a kid, and then that kid had another kid, and that kid had Rose. Right? Unity was great grandmother, so she'd have to have a kid. And that would be her grandmother, and then Rose. Yes! Okay, sorry. Have to do generational shit. But, since Warpies got back, Unity's up. Rose is, try is working with this Lyda chick, uh, Lyda Hall, to find her brother, and they go down to Florida to, like, find him. They're introduced to these house guest people that I could give a shit about. But she's a dream vortex. Morpheus is like, uh, what the fuck are you doing here? Because they got in, they were trying to find Jed 2 because they can't see his dream shit in their library. There's also some tippy shit with Lucien and Dream, where Dream's tr pretty much trying to reassert his control, but he's like, I do like the thing of him being kind of like haughty, but the thing is he takes his responsibilities very seriously and doesn't like that he was captured and that those responsibilities fell to Lucien. Not that she is not capable of it, but that it was his responsibilities and he should have been taking care of it and he hate that it was forced upon her. And they kind of want to figure out how to do and fix different kind of ways. And we do see that the Vortex starts like breaking shit in the dreaming because she breaks down walls between dreams and reality. But she's trying to find her brother, and her brother is pretty much in this foster care hair hole as the father's friends pretty much took him in to pretty much get $800 a month for support. And that Galt, one of the other... There's Galt, the Corinthian, and Fiddler's Green that had escaped from the dreaming, and that Morpheus is trying to use Rose as the dream vortex kind of, to kind of find him, which is kind of stupid and just kind of like, all right, whatever. You're trying to do these kind of... I, wish that the I liked the quest kind of structure of him getting his vestments and I understand them trying to attempt to do this kind of quest structure in the second half but it just doesn't work for me it's just like all right because they find the gulp who's pretty much been working with Jed as he has been pretty much going around in his dreams as the Sandman but he takes the gulp the shapeshifter and puts her in darkness and Lucian doesn't agree with it but and pretty much hits of like I want to change I don't want to be a nightmare but Morpheus is like nightmares have value as well. They show and help humans confront their fears. It's like, ah, I like that. That is a very good way to do it. But however, if that is your job and your role and your purpose, and that doesn't jive with you, you should be able to kind of change that. And he does that later on where he does change her into a dream as she then goes and flies and does shit, showing that Morpheus has the capacity to change. Well, Rose is doing her shit to try and find her brother, but the current thing gets to him first. While this is going on, she starts breaking down dream things, and Lyda has sex with her dead husband in the dreaming, and has a kid that then makes her pregnant in the real world. And Morpheus is like, that's fucking wrong. That's gonna do some weird fucking shit. And he had pretty much told Rose that she had the power to create universes and destroy them. And he's like, listen, this isn't right. You're you've allowed her to dream a dead person into the dreaming. That can't happen. And he kabooshes the Hector dude. And she's like, get the fuck out, pretty much. I'm like, um, you're fucking around and pretty much fusing a lot of different kind of shit together. You know? And could Morpheus have done it in a better and nicer way? Yes. However, that's not working. Uh, it's like you don't want the dead person there because they're going to be fucked up and do some crazy ass shit probably even though it's never explained why that would be a bad thing now granted having a dream kid in the world 
that could also do a lot of kind of weird shit. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to have to come for that baby. And she's like, no, fuck you. And the light of chick, I'm like, I kind of get it, but you fucked your dead husband in the dream world and you were just going to kind of stay there if you died. But however, you, if you died, death would have come for, me, for you and tried to, like, jack you, but Rose is the vortex would probably do the main thing and the thing is she went down to florida after she like went to london to meet with unity and learn all that she's like oh i'll pay you and everything like that's so like all right cool just a lot of stuff that's like all right i get it but it's just not needed shit so she's pretty much going against morpheus we get this british kind of dude the Gilbert pops up out of nowhere and then it's like, yeah, this is probably one of the fucking dreams. Pillars Green's like, oh, I wanted to learn how to be human and shit. And while this is going on, uh, we also get this stupid subplot of, like, people who are serial killers that are fucking uh, fanboying out over the Corinthian and they get his attention by killing somebody similarly to the Corinthian. And he's like, what the fuck do you want? It's like, we want you to be our keynote speaker at our thing. The serial convention. Oh, it's like, all right. So he gets Jed and pretty much takes him to Georgia for that convention, and then Rose and Gilbert go and follow him. And Gilbert's like, this is the kind of fucked up shit. And then they almost get killed by one of the people there. The Corinthian kills him, puts him in the room, she goes to sleep. He's pretty much bringing them together for their dream of, like, fucking, like, murdering people. And Morpheus is like, this is fucked up. And I understand that they're trying to do stuff on the meditation of dreams and nightmares and hopes and fears and all that kind of stuff. But it's so messy and not well connected that it just becomes, oh, it's there. Like Rose, it's like, yeah, I'm going to do what I want to do. It's like, you don't even know what you can do. And the consequences and the ramifications. And then Morpheus is like, yeah, if you do this, everybody's going to get sucked in because we literally see... Uh, the manifestation of that as it sucks in the rest of the people from the house and killing him was like, listen, I can fix this shit, but I gotta stop this, alright? However, we didn't get the deus ex machina that the unity chick goes to sleep and like, oh yeah, uh, she talks to Lucienne and we find out that uh, Desire had pretty much made it so that way uh, Unity was supposed to be the, des uh, the dream vortex, however uh, Desire, since she fell asleep, Desire then had sex with her and then did one of her descendants as a child of the endless and if you kill family that unleashes some bad hoodoo evidently and it was trying to make that so that morpheus would do that and then i think like the fury the fates or furies or kindly ones or whatever would like take vengeance and kill his ass and i don't know that would do some crazy ass shit and they fucking deus ex it because it's like oh okay uh rose take the vortex out of you and then it's like you're in the dreaming and then it's like a heart like desire give it to you and she fucking auto dies i'm like um okay and then it was like yeah you could stay in the dreaming i don't give a shit i'm like oh god damn it i'm like oh and then the lighted chick gives birth to the baby and that of course is important later on because i we eat some shit because that person becomes the incarnation of dream after this incarnation gets killed at some point and I just didn't really give a crap about Rose and Jed. Like, I am empathetic to their suffering and everything, but I got nothing to connect with them just to be like, okay, you're a brother, uh, you're brother and sister, uh, you're the elder sister trying to look after your brother, and I get that. But it's just done and executed in a way that I don't care. Not even horrendously where I'm like, oh, this is kind of funny. It's just like, oh, yeah, you got the ability to essentially destroy the universe. And you're just going to be like, yeah, fuck you, dream dude. It's like, you do understand that you have no concept of how to control the dreaming or look after the dreaming or anything like that. And this entity does because that's his literal fucking job. And he's telling you, I got to watch that shit. But she evidently just auto takes it out like, hey, here, grandma, and great grandma. And then fucking like, all right. So they're together. They're uh, living in Jersey. And that's pretty much where it ends, where, like, also Dream, like, starts doing shit better in the Dreaming. And I'm just like, alright. It was very weird. Like, I didn't actively hate this one, 
and I wanted to like it, but so many odd choices were made, and so many boring kind of things lengthened and padded out this, that it's like, wow, it's pretty to look at, it's got themes and everything that I'm interested in, and would be really cool to, like, delve in and try and think about and understand, but the characters just weren't there, and the stories weren't connected and executed well enough for me to give that much of a crap about it. And the thing is, it wasn't done so horribly as to be entertaining or super, like, frustrating of, like, any kind of thing. I would be like, pass on this. Like, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. Like, there's better things out there to explore, like, dreams, the understandings of, like, all that kind of stuff and all that. And it's just, there's just better stuff out there. Like, I'm like, I... Yeah. There's better good stuff and better bad stuff to kind of watch. And you'd be like, what the fuck did I just watch? Velocipaster. Again, I don't recommend Velocipaster either. That was just... I thought it was going to be good. And... I like... I thought it was going to be good bad. And then it just was bad bad. This, I'm just mainly neutral and just be like... No, there's better stuff out there. Uh, action... Eh, not really enough. If you're into action, this won't really satisfy you. If you're into characters and plot and development, I don't think this would work either. The graphics and everything works well. Oh, and also at the end we see that Lucifer's decided to come up with a plan to pretty much uh, expand hell throughout the whole universe instead of leaving hell. And that the demons want to vengeance on Morpheus. I'm like, okay. So yeah, those are my opinions on the season, first season of The Sandman. Tell me what you guys think in the comments below. If you liked it, if you didn't like it, if you agree with me, if you disagree with me. Also, like and subscribe, and I hope you have a good day.